Hi everyone. So uh, this is the third day of our uh, shutdown, uh, um, shelter in place, right? So um, obviously, I, I uh, I'm doing this uh, online. I'm I'm hoping that um, those who normally come to our um, meditation, our youth meditation. Uh, can still um, hear this. So a couple of days ago, our president uh, used the word, the phrase Chinese ver uh, virus, uh, as opposed to Wuhan virus, or uh, as opposed to COVID-19, uh, uh, which is the official name, and um, generated a lot of excitement and people would say that um, well that's 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 racial prejudice because it kind of sends uh, the wrong message yeah, with the idea that all of us who look like Chinese people uh, would be discriminated against so um, th there's a lot to talk about here and my intention is not to be political correct or even try to change people's mind here but that maybe um, to give some background on the history of um, China and Chinese or or actually the the correct um, interpretation for the word Chinese in in is Middle Kingdom and just kind of talk about all of that in in a historical context right and especially to to us to, to most of us here who are what we call Chinese Americans right so first of all I, I want to be very clear about what it means to be Chinese Americans um, being American uh, is the noun, right? We are all Americans, either by birth. Uh, I'm sure some of you are, were born here. Uh, I myself were not born here. I came here when I was uh, 15 years old, and I became American citizen when I was 20, after I'd been here long enough that um, I took the exam and, and swore an oath to uh, bear arms. Um, interesting. If you were born here, you didn't. You didn't. You never had to take the uh, the, the oath to bear arms for the country. But when you become a naturalized citizen, like I do, you, you you do have to take that that extra step. But being American um, obviously means uh, certain benefits. But more important than that is it's it's an obligation. Right? It's an obligation to an idea that all men are created equal. But at the same time, all men have to bear equal responsibility. Right? It's it's a it's both a responsibility and obligation. But anyway, um, that's who we are. We are all Americans. Being Chinese American just means that, in this case, a Chinese is an adjective. It just gives some um, cultural background, cultural um, information about who we are, who are who you know our, our heritage and so forth. So when we talk about um, discrimination, we really have to talk about it from the perspective of being American first. When I was when when my kids were young, they're they're in, they're up, they're approaching the thirties now. But when they were young, I remember one day we were driving. This is when they were like toddlers you know and they were sitting in the back of the van talking when they just this is when they started to go to school and for some reason they, they talk about uh, being discriminated and this is uh, when when we first came to to United States being discriminated is not a topic of discussion it's a fact um, we accept that we accept that that this is not a country um, 
and we have to earn our, rate, uh, our rights to be in this country. So we accept the racial discrimination as a fact. It, it wasn't something that we could talk about. So I, when I hear my kids talk about it, it was interesting, right? So, I'm, so then I said, I said something like, hey kids, um, what if you were to go to a restaurant and the owner said to you, we refuse to serve you because you're Chinese? What would you say to that? Is that discrimination? And the kids, yeah, that would be discrimination. That would be bad. We would sue them. I said, what, what if you come into a restaurant and they're so happy to see you that they say to you, oh, we want to give you extra service because you're Chinese. Would that be considered discriminations? And my kids kind of look at each other and says, no. I said, well, it is too. Discrimination is, is when you're given unfair treatment based on your race and your background. Right, so it's discrimination where there is something negative, and it's discrimination where is something is positive. So you couldn't cry discriminations when it's bad for you, when you didn't care when it was bad for someone else. So before you say that someone is discriminated against Chinese American, you have to kind of ask yourself, well, what did I do when they were discriminated against Muslim Americans, right? This is, this is, this is something that, that you have to think about all the time and not just when you feel that you're being mistreated, okay? When other people are mistreated, you have to stand up for their right as well. That's what being Americans mean. And you have to understand that, 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 that sometimes people want you to feel that you're being discriminated because they want you to think like a victim. So the thing that you need to do is you need to ask yourself, do I really want to be a victim or do I want to just work extra hard to overcome that, right? I remember when I was in, when I started to teach um, at, at UCLA, um, I attended um, the regular faculty meeting and I was the junior person. So, you know, you sit in the background like you're supposed to and just listen, you know? So all the senior members of the faculty were talking and talking and talking, and I was just listening. And all of a sudden, he, they turned to me and says, well, Denny, what do you think? You're a minority. And, and I didn't even think. I just reacted and I said, well, actually, I'm not. I'm not a minority. I'm just underrepresented. The difference is that you don't want to think like a victim here, okay? So regardless of what people say, when they say Chinese virus, instead of reacting to that, you have to ask yourself, well, what, if, what happens when they say Spanish flu? Does that mean that they were discriminated against the Spanish? Right? What happens when they say Hong Kong flu? Right? So sometimes you, you kind of have to have a much broader mind and not fall into the trap of someone wanting you to be the victim. So I don't want to talk too much about that. I think this is something that you guys can figure out on your own, but I just wanted to talk about the word Chinese. What does Chinese mean? Okay. So um, as you know, I, I, I I go to, to, until recently, I go to the St. Quentin prison on Sunday to meditate with the inmates. Of course, I can't do that now because of the virus. Uh, the prison has shut down a couple of weeks ago. But in any case, a couple of weeks ago, we, we had a very distinguished visitor, uh, a woman by the name of Joanne Macy, who's 90 years old. Uh, he's a very, very famous author. He had written about eight books. Uh, on all different topics, um, on anti-nuclear, on peace, on justice, on environmentalism. Uh, he has a PhD, she has a PhD in religious study, and she spent her entire life um, 
talking about spiritual issues. Um, she herself is a Buddhist um, student of Thich Nhat Hanh. And um, she comes in uh, regularly. Um, and so last time she was there, um, she talked about her experience when she was working uh, with the Peace Corp back in the f late 50s, 60s in India, in North India, near, near the border of um, Nepal. And she talks about how um, all of a sudden there was an influx of Tibetans, people, refugees from Tibet who were escaping the invasion. So in the, in the mid-50s, the Chinese government invaded Tibet, and so Dalai Lama and many, many um, religious leaders had to escape, and they took with them you know, hundreds and thousands of refugees. And these these people, um, you know, they actually have to um, walk, you know, they actually have to walk, and they walked up to the Himalayas and down across the border to Nepal and, and to India. I mean, wearing no shoes. I mean, seriously. And they many of them die from the cold. And when they eventually get to India, they die from the disease. It turns out that um, they had no protection against many of the viruses and bacteria infections. So it was a very, very difficult time. And so uh, Joanne was talking about her experience and spiritual experience, you know, what, what she was learning from the Lamas. And interestingly, she keeps saying, you know, when the Chinese invaded Tibet and when the Chinese invaded Tibet, and she said that like five or six times. So finally, when, we, when she finished, I, uh, I raised my hand and and she's kind of, she's kind of deaf, so so you have to the, the 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 way we do it is that there's an empty seat next to her where you have to sit down and, and speak to her to her left ear. So I did that. And I said, Joanne, thank you very much for the talk. It was wonderful, but I I do I do feel that I have an obligation to correct you because you keep saying that when the Chinese invaded Tibet, and and I being the only person here who as Chinese parents, I feel like uh, I have to say something. I said, um, the Chinese, the, the Tibet was invaded. That's a that's a historical fact. But Tibet was not invaded by the Chinese. Tibet was invaded by the communists. It was the communists who invaded Tibet, not the Chinese. The Chinese people were used as a tool much the same way that American people were used as tool to invade other countries. It's always a regime that invade other people, not the people. So I said, I feel like I need to explain a little bit about the word China, the origin of, of the word China. I said, the, the, when, when um, the first people, the, the, the four, first um, historically, the first people who had contact with what we call the Chinese people were the Indians. And so the word China actually came originally uh, from India about three or four hundred years uh, before Christ. And it was, uh, it was called Sina, C-I-N-A. And eventually, um, more and more people came into contact with the Chinese, including the Persians and the Arabs, and eventually the Europeans. So in modern days, the word Chinese actually came from the French word Qin or China. And so that's why um, a lot of the, when the, when the Japanese invaded, uh, when the Japanese military government, uh, I have to be consistent <laughs> here, <laughs> it's not the Japanese people who invaded the, to China, it was the Japanese military government who invaded China. They, they actually call China, China, China. And so when we speak to our elderly, they hated the term. They just absolutely hated the term China um, because it was it's considered a derogatory term. It was used by the Japanese military government. But in fact, China is actually um, the right word. 
And China means Qin. Qin is the name of a dynasty that was about 200 to 200 years uh, before Christ. And it's the Emperor Qin. It's the first emperor of China. It's the first emperor that united China. So in some way, Chinese, which came from the word China, had in it unification. It was after the Emperor Qin, the first emperor of China who united the Chinese people that allows the Chinese as a term used for 56 different ethnic groups. Now, granted that um, out of the 56 ethnic groups, the Han, which most of you are, and including myself, is almost 92% of the entire population. Okay, the remaining 55 ethnic groups, um, actually, um, much of that are, are Muslims. So many of us know about the Muslims, the, 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 the Uyghurs, right? The Uyghurs. We, we, we. But that's actually a smaller, um, smaller of the two groups of Muslims that coexist peacefully over thousands of years with the Han. The other group are the people that are in the middle of, of, uh, of China, the Zhang, okay? The, the way, I'm sorry, the way, H-U-I, the way. And that's actually the, the second biggest minority. The biggest minority group are those who are living in the southern border uh, with uh, Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, and, and Myanmar, okay? And then you went, and then in addition to that, you have the Manchurians who, who actually um, occupied China. It was the last uh, dynasty with the Manchurians. But then you also have Tibetans, right? Mongols, Koreans, actually. So all of that consists of 55 uh, different ethnic groups that coexist with the Han, and together there are the what's called the Chinese, or the, the essentially the people of the Emperor Qin. Right? That's where the word Chinese came from. It actually means harm. It actually represents harmony. It's it's a it's a, it's a, it's how the different ethnic groups, including the Han, have coexisted for many, many, many uh, years. And in China, you you um, um, you have different autonomous regions. There's five main autonomous regions, where uh, including the Guangxi, which is which is um, right above um, 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 uh, Vietnam and uh, and Laos. Uh, the Inner Mongolia, uh, the Nansi, where the where the where the Uyghurs live, the Muslims live, Tibet and in Sichuan, Sichuan is is where the Uyghurs live. So these are the five main autonomous regions where supposedly the minorities have um, rights to rule themselves. Not always, but that's at least in theory, right? So I just wanted to, to, to just kind of say that that it wasn't the Chinese who invaded Tibet. It was a, a regime. In this particular case, it was the, the, the communists, communists who invaded China, China uh, Tibet, and and I just wanted to kind of say when you talk about Chinese, it's not one group of people. It's it's, it's fifty six groups of people who live together. In fact, if you if you look at the the flag of Taiwan, that's the flag of the the Republic of China, which which was the after we overthrown the Qing Dynasty in nineteen eleven, I would say nineteen ten, something like that, then we formed the Republic. And that the original flag of the Republic of China is not the flag that you see now in Taiwan. The original flag actually has five different colors representing the five uh, major uh, minority group, ethnic group in China, including the Han. So when you think about Chinese people, think of it as 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 harmony. Okay, it's always been a harmonious people, right? Now, interestingly, um, sometimes things don't translate. So when you say Chinese, it doesn't translate into the Chinese word because Chinese means Qin. Qin doesn't translate. 
But when you say Chinese in 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 China in uh, China, it doesn't translate neither because actually when you write out the word China in in Chinese characters, it mean it actually means Middle Kingdom. It actually means Middle Kingdom. Okay, and. And, it, and then you have to ask, well, what, why Middle Kingdom? So most people will say, well, that's kind of a very equalistic perspective of the world, right? Because you think of yourself as the middle of the world, um, and then everybody else sort of um, uh, secondary to you. Well, actually, no. Actually, no. The, the, the word Middle Kingdom um, actually came from Confucius, who lives about 500 years before Christ. And Confucius is a scholar, and his idea, his idea of ethic, ethics, actually have um, have been the the central theme of the Chinese culture. And his, in in in, in the simplest way to think about the Confucius ethics is is with this uh, sentence we use, and I think it comes from the Bible, where it says, "Do up to others as you would have them do up to you." In Chinese, it means so but you must see you yan. It means that if you don't want something, then only apply it to someone else. All right. So when you think about what is the ethical way of treating other people, think about how you want them to treat you, and that's the way you want to treat them. It's a very simple idea. And so the word Middle Kingdom actually came when a student asked Confucius what would be considered the people who lives inside what we now call China. And he says, and he's, his answer is very simple. He says, well, it has to do with your, with your ethics, right? And if you're outside, i.e. if you are foreign to Middle Kingdom, and you would use a foreign set of ethics, then you're not considered a member of what we would now call the Middle Kingdom. But if you are... In, if you practice our ethics, then we would open our arms to you. And basically he's saying that as much as America is an idea, Middle Kingdom is an idea as well. That is a very inclusive idea, an idea that is built on harmony. That if you share our value system, then we would consider you as one of us. That's what being Americans mean. That's what it means. So when someone use a word called Chinese virus, it could very well be that that person who's using it has something negative in mind that he, he actually wants to perpetuate this idea that the Chinese people, whether they live in America or not, are not part of the majority. That we are, we are not, we are secondary to them, and you have a choice. You can stand up and fall into the trap of being a victim, or you can stand up even higher and say that even though I am a Chinese American, I am American first. I am American. Stand up for the ideal of being an American. That, um, and and. And the next time when you feel that something is unjust being done to a someone else, whether it's a Muslim American or Native American, you will feel just the same way. That you don't, you don't you, you, that that when something is is um, unfairly, uh, um, you're being unfairly mistreated, that you feel the same righteousness when someone else is being unfairly uh, mistreated. Okay. This is what's important, but um, this is this is we, we what we do here is <coughs> is um, uh, meditation. We study Buddhism. So um, the reason I talk about Chinese and Middle Kingdom is that I want to remind you that both of those terms are built on the simple idea of harmony, living harmoniously with others even when they're the same as you or when they're different from you. And, and this is what we have in common with our Buddhist teaching, is that the Buddhist teaching also builds on, on the foundation of harmony. 
In fact, when we when we when we do our Saturday practice, uh, we have we start with chanting the four immeasurables. Um, the four immeasurables are loving kindness, compassion, empathy, and equanimity, all of which are built on top of harmony. Okay. So when we chant the four immeasurables, we say, may we practice loving kindness to eliminate hostility for all beings. Okay? May we practice compassion to eliminate suffering for all beings. May we practice empathy to eliminate jealousy for all beings. May we practice equanimity to eliminate arrogance for all being. So in summary, whatever you do, don't fall into the trap of someone else wanting you to be the victim. Thank you.